Just give me some truth. No short head, yellow belly, son of tricky dick is gonna mother up a soft soap. Me with just a pocket full of soap. It's money for dope. Money for rope. I'm sick to death of hearing things from uptight, short-sighted, narrow-minded hypocrites. All I want is the truth now. Just give me some truth now. I've had enough of reading things by neurotic, psychotic, pig-headed politicians. All I want is the truth now. Just give me some truth now. All I want is the truth now Just give me some truth now All I want is the truth Just give me some truth All I want is the truth Episode 67 of Glass Onion. I'm John Lennon. I hope you're all doing well. The clip you just heard there, I hardly need to tell you. John Lennon aficionados. That was, of course, the isolated vocal track from Give Me Some Truth from the Imagine album. And although I suppose every episode of Glass Onion on John Lennon is a search for the truth, today we've got a slightly different spin on it in that we have a historian or a history professor or a historiographer I have major troubles with that word during the conversation, but got it right that time. Before I get to today's show, just a couple of things. There was a John Lennon documentary on British TV last week. It's part of a series called A Life in Ten Pictures. They've done Muhammad Ali and they've done a few other people. I haven't seen the John Lennon one, but I just wanted to make you aware that it was out there. And uh, I'm sure it will magically appear online at some point. The other thing I wanted to say was kind of an announcement slash request. I'd like to do a listener questions episode, but with a little bit of a different spin on it, I'd like to send me questions in audio form. So MP3 is the easiest and the files will be small, so you can just send them by email. The email address, of course, is glassonionpod at yahoo.com. And what I'd like you to do is just say your name and where you're from. You can make a short comment about the show if you want, you know, pump my ego. (laughs) <laughs> but yes you, you can make a comment and then um yeah what i'm looking for not so much quiz questions but you know anything that you'd be interested in mine and my guests opinions on because i'm i won't tell you who it is but i'm going to get a very popular guest from a show we did uh, a few months ago who's going to be helping me answer these questions you can make them about john lennon of course we can broaden it out to Beatles, whatever you feel but um Give us something, I don't know, thought-provoking, amusing, or both, that we can get our teeth into, and we'll take a decent stab at answering those. Obviously, I don't know what kind of response I'm going to get from this. I might get none, I might get a hundred, but uh, at some point, obviously, if I get a lot of these questions, we'll have to put some kind of limit on them. But, uh, you know, it could easily be stretched out to two or three episodes. So um, that's my request. So... A question in audio form on mp3 say your name where you are from brief comment on the show if you want and then your question so to today's show so the guest today is Aaron Torkelson Weber otherwise known as Aaron Weber but I like the name Torkelson so I'm going with that she explains that as well she's the author of the book the Beatles and the historians and she's uh, appeared on a number of Beatles shows and she's a really good guest I think everyone who's had her on their shows would agree with that Obviously, the talk is primarily about John Lennon and the Beatles, but we do start by talking about um, a little bit about US history and propaganda. And in fact, Erin will be appearing on Life and Life Only, one of my other podcasts, later this year. Not sure exactly when, but she did agree to that. We talk also about, uh, with history, the, the emotional component to it, to seeking the truth and to finding objectivity, if objectivity actually exists. I think that's debatable. But uh, certainly Erin does her very best to be objective and to find the truth, as I do in my own small way. We also talk about the the distance aspects of history, 
and then we talk about John and Paul and some of the song authorship disputes and then um, we talk about the relationship of the pop star with the media and of course we get to our favourite topic on Glass Onion I don't even need to tell you what that is you know what I'm talking about there's just one thing I wanted to say. I was going to put this at the end, but I'm going to put it at the beginning instead. We do briefly mention the Bob Wooler incident. Again, um, John Lennon fans will know what I'm talking about. The 1963 incident at Paul McCartney's 21st birthday when Bob Wooler made a joke about John and Brian and their recent holiday to Spain. And John, in his very inebriated state, proceeded to beat Bob Wooler up. Now, I do say during the conversation about Albert Goldman that Goldman said that John Lennon picked up a shovel and beat Bob Willer to death. Now, obviously, what I meant was <laughs> started to beat Bob Willer to death. The point was that Goldman introduces a shovel into the occasion rather than uh, all the other reports are just John Lennon, I think, kicking Bob Willer in the ribs. Anyway, just in case you were listening and you thought, oh, what was he talking about? Bob Willer was very much alive for uh, decades after that and was always uh, a popular character at Beatles conventions, particularly the one in Liverpool, obviously. Anyway, I'm not going to spoil any more. Just to say there's a couple of other clips during the conversation, but uh, I think it all speaks for itself, and I will see you on the other side with a few words. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Glass Onion on John Lennon, and I'm delighted to have with me Aaron Weber. Is it Aaron Weber or Aaron Torkelson Weber? Which do you prefer? It's either one. Torkelson okay. is my maiden name. It's Norwegian in heritage, uh-huh. and Weber is Germanic. Okay, perfect. Now, Aaron, I've been, I've listened to a lot of the podcasts that you've done already, but you've done a fair few. You've had some epic conversations with Robert Rodriguez, which I will link to because uh, you got into some amazing stuff. And I've heard you on the Beatles books. You did that one with Joe. Mm-hmm. And then you're on Let It Roll, actually, which I'm going to be appearing on at some point to talk about the Goldman book. So I'm always sensitive to the fact that I don't want to just give you the same stuff to repeat that you've already talked about. So uh, anyway, how are you? So I didn't ask you how you were. (laughs) I'm doing fine. I've made it through the first day of the Fab Four Con, and then later this afternoon Mm. I'm doing the live Q&A. Obviously that will be done by the time you post this. So hopefully it went well. Yeah, this might not be out for a while, I've got to be honest, because I'm about seven or eight episodes behind in terms of editing. So <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, I'm I understand. Not, I'm not sure I'm going to be hearing this, but we're recording this uh, on the 21st of February. So your book was The Beatles and the Historians, a book about Beatles books from a historiographical. Is that a word? It is a so. word. I think it is. It is, yeah. it is not a word that my publisher wanted me to put in the title. <laughs> too long, too many syllables. It doesn't enhance sales is what they said. Yeah, it's not sexy enough. Yeah. No. (laughs) Just tell us about your blog as well before we get into the topics today. Well, I have a blog that is called The Historian and the Beatles. And for the moment, it's on relative hiatus. I had two kids in the space of three years, the last one just last March. And so that's been preoccupying my time. But when it does really start to get new content again, what I focus on is providing book reviews for books that I generally did not cover in The Beatles and the Historians, placing them in their respective narratives, looking at their strengths and their weaknesses methodologically. So basically continuing a lot of the work I did in my book, but with new material. It must be tough when you write a book and then you're inevitably going to be fined that in the, in the years after that, you're going to find out new information. Have you brought out different versions of the book or, or not? No, I'm not planning to do that at the moment. Perhaps again, when my youngest ones are a little older and I have the time to really devote the attention to that. So they're in charge at the moment, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Before we get into the Beatles and John Lennon stuff, I am a bit of a history buff, I've got to be honest. And one of the things that we're going to get into with the Beatles stuff, but which is true of any historical event is the idea of narratives and the idea of conflicting narratives. Now, From my understanding, with historical events, there's essentially a mainstream or let's call it an official version Mm -hmm. that gets accepted up to a point. And then that finds its way into history books. And crucially, of course, it gets taught to kids at school. So let's say that um, a few generations back in Britain, the coverage of the British Empire for young kids of my grandparents' generation, would have been, I would say, quite different from the reality. Probably would have left a few things out. What's the current state in American schools? How much do they teach about America's history? It depends on your grade level, essentially. 
I received, and I'm going by personal experience here, very little history in elementary school. We tended to focus more on social studies, and they did do a little bit of American history, but quite a bit of it was the structure of the American government, which obviously is very necessary. You would learn about basic geography, different continents, countries of the world. When you progressed into middle school, you had to take the history of your state. And that also has a great deal of value. It really isn't until high school that you start to get American history. And then when you do, you have a very, very basic, fundamental, rote facts presentation of what it is. If you want to go further in depth, it's an elective. So it's something that you can choose to take. And I was the odd student who loved history, so I chose to take those upper-level history classes that went more in-depth onto narrower subjects. Mm -hmm. But a lot of students do not take that option if they don't love history, and that's where a lot of American students stop. In college, what you have to do, presumably depending on your major, have to take one or two courses of history, but it doesn't have to be American history. It can be world civilizations or it can be the history of various countries. So really, we do not emphasize history in the American educational system. Right, right. And if we took, um, if we took an event like the American Civil War, which I have heard you talk about on other podcasts, has that narrative changed? And could you give us an example of how that's changed? And has, has it happened over time? Or The American Civil right. War is a classic narrative in it's shifted over time. It's also shifted because of politicization. And what you have is when the war breaks out, and I could talk about this for hours, so I'm going to have to restrain oh, myself <laughs> okay. from not going, going too in-depth. The declaration is made that the war primarily is being fought over the issue of slavery and the rights of the Confederate states to retain their slaves and the rejection of Abraham Lincoln as president of the United States, because it is Lincoln's election that leads to the secession of the southern states. What you have then is almost immediately a propaganda war that is waged in both the North and the South, where the South claims that the war is being waged unfairly as a war of Northern aggression against the South in an effort to control the South and to take its wealth. So what happens is the American Civil War, a lot of people don't realize, is really considered by some military historians to be the first modern war in that you have two sides that are relatively equally matched. This isn't like the colonial wars of the 1800s. This is a brutal and technologically advanced war where both sides really have an equal amount of weaponry, which would be very contrasting to the colonial wars of this period. And that's why you get so many casualties. And what's ironic, if you study newspapers, British newspapers or French newspapers from the American Civil War, is they are appalled and disgusted at the casualties that are occurring in the American Civil War, saying to the effect of, well, civilized nations don't do this sort of thing. Whereas, of course, in 50 years, you're going to have World War I, and that criticism is going to ring very hollow. Well, what happens very quickly is the North winds for a variety of reasons that I do not have the time to go into here because the focus is the Beatles and not the American Civil War. (laughs) And the war ends, or excuse me, not officially ends, but Lee surrenders on April 9th and Abraham Lincoln is assassinated on April 14th and dies on April 15th. Hmm. And so you have very quickly the mixture of the historiography of the Civil War, the narrative of the Civil War getting mixed up with the martyrdom of Lincoln Mm. and the occupation of the Confederacy. And it's the only part of the United States that has ever been under military occupation. So there's a great mix of all these aspects. And what we see very quickly is that the South will argue in its books about the war, in its editorials about the war, that this was a war that was unjust Mm. and that it was a war of northern aggression. They will particularly focus their resentment and criticism on Ulysses S. Grant, as he was the general who led the final offensive that led to the defeat of Robert E. Lee and eventually the Confederacy. They do not generally try to criticize Lincoln publicly because by virtue of his death, 
by virtue of his murder, Lincoln was regarded as a martyr. If anyone has a chance, I would highly suggest going to the Lincoln Museum in Springfield, Illinois, because they have coverage of what press coverage of Lincoln was in his lifetime, Mm. both from the Northern press, the Southern press, and from the British press. Mm. And there are enormous pieces of evidence talking about how Lincoln was vilified, he was criticized, he was regarded as a tyrant, he was regarded as unconstitutional, he was too radical on slavery, he wasn't radical enough on slavery, but much of that is very swiftly glossed over mm. once Lincoln is assassinated. I'm trying not to spend too much time Don't on worry. this. Okay. <laughs> what happens in the period following Reconstruction, which again is the occupation of the South by the North, Reconstruction ends in 1876. And you have a very deliberate push by the people of the Confederacy to portray the war, again, as this war of northern aggression, and particularly one that now they're pushing the idea that it has less to do with slavery, and again, more of a violation of states' rights. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, going to concentrate on Ulysses S. Grant, and now he is going to be depicted as a butcher of a general rather than a strategic military genius. You are going to have a very fervent promotion of this version of events. And what's ironic is I think almost everyone knows the cliche that uh, history is written by the victors. Whereas in this case, we have a number of historians who argue that the South won the history of the American Civil War for approximately following the Reconstruction period in certain areas, even in the North, up through the 1930s and the 1940s. And we have histories of African-American slavery that are published in this time period that argue that it was a relatively benign institution, that it cost the slave owners more than it profited them. Mm. And there are any number of methodological errors with that book, but it was really the first examination of African-American slavery in academia. And so other academics or people who are studying history had to reference it because it was the first. And so what you see then is we really only start to shift away from these narratives within, in certain cases, the last 30 or 40 years. And again, it depends on where you live in the United States. The northern states became more interested in looking at evidence that contradicted the war of northern aggression policy, probably in about the 1960s and the 1970s. But I'm trying to remember if it was Joe or who it was. I was discussing the Nate, um, I think. Yes, you're right. It was yeah. Nate. And he grew up in Texas. And I think he said the 60s or the 70s. And he was still being taught the war of northern aggression version of the American Civil War. Wow. Yeah, by the way, I'm going to get you onto my general podcast in the future to talk about propaganda. <laughs> I've just decided. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> wow. We could definitely go on this tangent for a while. But um I have to admit, I'm very ignorant about the American Civil War. My knowledge of British history is not so bad, but the Vietnam War is actually the one that I've probably studied the most. And there's so much about that that is just not even acknowledged. And did you say that you saw any of the Ken Burns series? Did you? I only saw the first part. Right, right. I mean, that first part wasn't bad because that history is not really that contentious. You know, the French were in Vietnam and then and then the Americans were. But, you know, there's all this other stuff that was left out, you know, all the, all the stuff, the drug trade that was a, such a huge part of the Vietnam War. So how do I word this? When does the pressure to change the narrative get so much that it gets changed? I'm sorry if that's such a general question. Is it just because there's so much evidence that these mainstream narratives have to be altered? Is that possible to answer sometimes that can be it yes sometimes Mm. when you have this influx of new primary sources and i think Mm. one of the examples i use in the book is i think his last name is fisher was a german historian who had studied world war one and prior to fisher in i think the 1960s germany restricted access to certain parts of their world war one archives and therefore You had German historians who always argued, well, the origin of the war is not solely or primarily Germany's fault. And what Fischer did is because he gained access to those archives that previously had been inaccessible, Mm. he found documents that offered a fairly compelling case that Germany did want a war. And I'm not Mm. saying that Germany is solely to blame for World War I, Mm. but 
it was this new primary source evidence that pushed a new narrative or a new version of events or really reverted back to the original narrative for a certain period of time. But politicization also matters. Who is in power at a certain period of time? And also whether the population is willing to accept the historical narrative. And there's a great quote from that. And I think it's from C. Van Woodward, Woodard, and he's a famous American historian. He comments on the American Civil War, but he also comments on the American portrayal in its early histories of George III, who was king of England during the time of the American Revolution. And he points out that it was decades before, and I'm trying to remember the exact quote, I think he says, it was entirely safe for an American historian to acknowledge that George III was not a bloodthirsty tyrant, because that's not what the general population wanted to hear. So it also matters what the population wants to hear in terms of whether narratives get accepted or rejected. It has to do with evidence. It has to do with politicization. And also, is there a market for it? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I talk about, sorry, listeners, we will get onto the Beatles in a second, I promise. (laughs) This is the way I've managed to stretch a podcast about one person out to more than two (laughs) years. You see, by branching off, you've got to do it Mm -hmm. sometimes. One of the things that I've written about when i had a blog and i'll put it in my other podcast as well is the weaponization of the term conspiracy theory now i totally understand that there are conspiracy theorists on the internet who don't do any research and they just want to believe that there's a secret group that's pulling the strings Mm -hmm. whereas i would tend to go more with the fact that they're probably think tanks or there's a council on foreign relations and people like that that there are people pulling the strings but that it's not some dark smoky room but what i've found from my kind of alternative research, if you want to call it that, is that this term conspiracy theory has now become so general that it is applied to anyone who tries to tell you that an official narrative is wrong. And what I was getting at when I was asking about when does the pressure come is that let's compare the murder of John F. Kennedy and 9-11, okay? So there are alternative theorists slash conspiracy theorists in both of those cases. But with JFK, I think there's so many things that at the very least seem very fishy, you know, same with Martin Luther King as well, his death, that they almost have to be accepted up to a point. Whereas with 9-11, if you watch certain documentaries, you will say, you know, wow, there, there does seem to be a lot of strange things and towers like that have never fallen at free fall speed, etc. But it, because 9-11 is relatively recent, and I think as well, people don't want to accept it. It was such a huge event, such a traumatic event that people don't want to accept it. What would you say about that? Well, I think particularly in regards to September 11th, Mm. part of that issue would be this aspect of historical distance, which is something that I mentioned in my book, that you really have to take in certain subjects, regarding certain subjects, particularly if there's a level of trauma associated with an event, which absolutely there would be for September 11th. That means there's also an emotional response, but... Historical distance allows you, and in some cases it takes decades, to take a step back and look at the grander scope of things, and also for new evidence to come out that didn't come out initially or perhaps was overlooked initially. And that's something you see as a pattern in the historiography of really almost any subject is is new evidence coming out. But Again, as someone who obviously lived through September 11th or watched as it happened, there's an emotional reaction to the description of September 11th that I do not have with the assassination of John F. Kennedy. But I recall having a professor cry in front of my history class as he described the assassination of John F. Kennedy. He had that emotional connection to it that I do not. So I may be capable of demonstrating greater objectivity looking at the assassination of Kennedy than I would for the time being September 11th. Yeah. And I mean, you can often be accused, not you, I'm saying one can often be accused of uh, lacking a heart because, you know, it's like, oh, you can look at this event, you know, you're looking at it so clinically, but as you said, you've got to do that. And you can do that unless you're, you know, actually intimately involved with the event itself. Unfortunately, that has to be done. And so much of politics now is turned into emotion. You know, it's about mm-hmm. people being triggered and getting hysterical about things. The other thing, uh, again, it's just too long a tangent, but sin by omission or 
a kind of revisionism. So I'm just going to give one 9-11 example. This is not going to be a 9-11 truth uh, speech by me. But uh, if you actually go back to the original report on the day on, I think it was CNN, which is very mainstream, mm-hmm. they actually have reporters saying this looks like a controlled demolition. And if you remember the, the plane that went down in Shanksville, they have reports of like just basically a hole in the ground and no wreckage. And the reporter saying there's no evidence of any plane crash here. And the only point I'm trying to make is that, as you said, new evidence is one thing, but the other side of the coin is basically revising the old evidence as well. So um, I'm not going to ask you for your opinion on that. But <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I have not studied that extensively at all. Right, right. I understand. But I think, we, I think we've covered some interesting stuff there. So historical distance, you know, changing narratives. Really, it's a war of narratives. And now with the internet, you know, it's like my opinion, your opinion, <laughs> The facts uh, sometimes coincide with these opinions, but sometimes not, you know. So anyway, let's get on. So after talking about world wars and all this important stuff, let's get on to the relative (laughs) triviality of the Beatles uh, drama. Sounds good. Uh, So as I said, you've obviously talked about these four narratives. So I'm going to save you the trouble of talking to them. I'm going to go through them briefly. but I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about them. So the first narrative in your book is the Fab Four narrative, which lasted more or less until... Lennon remembers, I suppose, so until 1970. And I think you've said that um, Hard Day's Night was a big part in uh, this narrative, he, even though I just did a review of that on another podcast, and it's quite cartoony, actually, when you when you watch that film again. Mm-hmm. And to think that anyone actually thought that was reality at the time is quite strange. But <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, it's not even just so much, although it does have that, that pseudo-documentary aspect to it, which mm. gives it a veneer of authenticity. I think another issue that's important to remember is that it's the first real long impression that we get of the Beatles. And for some fans, it really would have been their first exposure to the band. And one thing that you see in history is that it's very difficult to dislodge first impressions. Yeah, unfortunately, they put uh, like a, a little grandfather in the middle of it, which uh, <laughs> in the film, you know, I know I know exactly what you mean. And also we've got, you know, the Beatles' first USA visit. I think it was called Yeah, Yeah, Yeah in America. You know, the Maisel's Brothers film, mm-hmm. which came out the same year. And actually, if you do a side by side with Hard Day's Night, it's very, very similar, you know. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I found fascinating doing this podcast is how really it was John Lennon who was consciously or subconsciously trying to smash this image in small ways you know i mean he's talked about even little things like undoing the top button on his shirt you know and paul would apparently do the button up and there's a little clip from 1965 when they're on the way to the bahamas to film help and the the reporter says oh what did you do on the plane and john says oh we got stoned (laughs) and the reporter says well no i know you're only joking and he's and john says no i'm not joking (laughs) There's his little attempts. Would you agree that it was John Lennon who perhaps tried more than the others to smash this image in, in small ways before 1970? I think those are really good examples. But I also think that by the time we get to 1966, 1967, you see more pushback from George and Paul also of maybe not so much the Beatles mythology, but of their Fab Four image. Because you have Paul talking about using Sgt. Pepper to bury that image. You have his interview with Maureen Cleave where he's far from simply charming and you have him harshly criticizing America's race relations and you have George criticizing Vietnam. So that's a slightly different angle Mm. because it's not necessarily that they're rejecting the Beatles mythology, but they are pushing back against their caricaturizations, I guess you could say. Yeah, and what you were saying earlier about the public accepting it, I guess we know now that journalists were essentially not paid off as such, but John Lennon's version was that the journalists got all the advantages of the Beatles, the parties and everything in return for not smashing Mm -hmm. the image. So um, I think there's a huge thing about not wanting to believe that. But, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, if if you think about them in 67, Paul does his LSD interview. Mm-hmm. You know, and the way they had changed visually was so light years from from a hard day's night. It's quite staggering. You know, three years. It's just astonishing. So then we've got the Lennon remembers. I think we all kind of know what what was happening here. You know, John Lennon. I don't know whether he, he invented this sort of glamorization of pain and drugs. Do you know what I mean? Like he he talks about I I'm in pain and I'm so artistic and he, he spins this very very 
clear, but if you think about it, not very nuanced idea that real artist has to be in pain and all the time, you know? What do you think? I hadn't thought about that, whether he originated that. Mm. Even if he didn't originate it, I think you could certainly argue that he's the one who popularized it, Mm. who made it what I guess you could call a trope, that genius is pain. Yeah. But I think the whole image of him, you know, the the center parting, the granny glasses. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think if there were people that looked like that. I mean, obviously Jesus looked a bit like that without the glasses. But, you know, I'm sure people that had been, you know, long haired uh, people mm-hmm. with that image. But he created such a striking image of kind of arty, cool, but intellectual. So mm-hmm. it was such a strong image. But. You know, I don't know when the last time you listened to Lennon Remembers, but the more I listen to it, I don't listen to it often, but every now and again, you know, clips will come up for the show and mm-hmm. he just sounds more and more like a basically a wounded child. And I think the impact of the primal therapy, my view on it is that he was essentially reduced back to childhood. Have you listened to that interview recently or have you just read the text? I haven't listened to it recently. It's mm. been a while since I listened to it. Again, I've heard clips from it every once in a while. There's a book, The... Uh, Beatles annotated bibliography and in their description of Lennon remembers they describe John's comments on Paul at least as toxic yet infantile and I think there's some validity to that it's an emotional interview and what I've seen is Winner obviously but also some other Beatles authors who will seize on that emotion and say because of this emotional element that grants this interview greater validity when actually that is completely wrong according to historical methods because if you have that searing emotion particularly something like anger which we know john was angry during that interview because he admitted being angry in that interview and furthermore admitted that that anger caused him to lie about certain things in that interview strong emotion actually minimizes your credibility as a source. So just as an historian, the the first thing that really struck me about Lennon Remembers is, number one, just how compelling it is, absolutely. But number two, also how many issues there are with it methodologically that were flat out ignored for so many decades. Yeah, and it goes back to what you are saying earlier about having the emotional side of it. You know, if something uh, happens to one of your family, then you're the worst person to decide what to do with that person who committed it because you're so emotionally involved in it. I mean, I've actually read The Primal Scream. I mean, it's a very, it's an interesting book. I mean, The Primal mm-hmm. Therapy is interesting, mm-hmm. but um, it's also very contentious. And I, I think one of the things with John Lennon, he was so charismatic, and I think that developed over the years, that, you know, we know all about the demagogue, you know, the idea of a demagogue that's so charismatic that everybody just hangs on their every word, you know, the the, mm-hmm. the alpha male, so to speak. Right. But I think, um, was it in 1974 that John and George interview? There's a brief clip, and he pretty much debunks it then, doesn't he? He does. He describes it as the equivalent of banging his head and then shouting ow. He (laughs) gives a crawdaddy interview. I also think in 74 where he says that the crawdaddy interview should be entitled Lennon Forgets. (laughs) You have him dismissing the interview's importance to George Martin, to Glenn Johns. Uh, I'm trying to remember some of the other figures that he had criticized in the interview and basically saying, I was high, I was off my head. And we have, again, testimony from people like Pete Shotton and May Pang about how John would give interviews. And I'm trying to remember what May's exact phrase was, you know, for him, they were an occasion to blow off steam and then forget about what he had said. And one of the issues with Lennon remembers is that That was not allowed to happen in part because of the agenda of Wenner and Rolling Stone. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe one of the other things, we're going to get onto John Lennon and the press in a minute, but I think perhaps if they deal with the press for a long time, they probably think, well, the press is going to print what they want anyway. So it's that game of giving them a good story, you know? Mm. Absolutely. I think that's a big part of it the good story aspect, the new story aspect, because Mm. what you have with the McCartney press release, after he's ended the Beatles with the McCartney press release, you don't have a new version of events until John offers Lennon Remembers. And not only is it a new version of events, it's an interesting version of events. It's compelling. It fits with the politicization of the time period. Mm. And it's Again, something new for the media to cover. I don't want to get too far off here, but I remember in terms of sports, 
I'm a very devoted Kansas City Chiefs fan. So most of this year was very good for me. And then the last game was very bad. But a few years ago, they got to the AFC Championship game and they lost in overtime to the Patriots because that's what everyone does. And there was a reaction from some of the reporters who were in the press box watching the end of the AFC Championship game. And there were national reporters as well as local reporters who said when the Patriots won, a lot of reporters just threw up their hands and said, what are we going to say about this team that we have not already written about in the last 20 Mm. years? Mm. We're tired of covering the same stories. So if you look at it from that angle, the press, if, if it's not the Boston Globe, obviously, would probably have preferred a Chiefs victory because it would have given them new stories and it would have given them new angles and approaches to look at. So if you want to apply that same issue to Lennon Remembers, the Fab Four narrative is tapped out and then it's denounced by Paul McCartney or at least killed by Paul McCartney. Mm. And so the press wants a new story. They want a fresh story and a new angle. And Lennon Remembers gives them that. And again, crucially, it's one that fits with the political schism of the time period. Yeah, that's right. There are kind of a what we call now truth bombs in that interview as well. You know, it's not all rambling. That's the problem with it. John Lennon's playing the role. I mean, I was talking earlier about conspiracy theorists. It's almost like someone on the internet who's dispensing some stuff that's true and then some ramblings. And you can't, the difficulty is to try and uh, get the, you know, the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Anyway, let's just go on with these narratives. Sorry. So the third one is uh, shout and just, very briefly for any listeners who haven't heard of it is this is the Philip Norman book in the wake of John Lennon's death famously he said John Lennon was three quarters of the Beatles George and Ringo are more or less absent was it on your blog that you talked about Norman changing his mind or doing an about face almost and you you talked about the prevailing narrative wins why do we think Norman did change his view was that from evidence or some sort of uh, maneuvering there Well, it's important to note that Norman has contradicted himself on this issue various times over the decades. I think the first time he truly addresses the issue, and in particular, the main criticism of Shout is the bias against Paul McCartney. Interestingly enough, he does not receive nearly as much criticism for his marginalization of George and Ringo, although in my reading, that is just as much of an accuracy issue with Mm. Shout as his bias regarding Paul McCartney. It's just that it's more overt regarding Paul, whereas George and Ringo are so marginalized that the criticisms of them don't receive as much attention because there aren't as many. But to go back, the first time I think Norman addresses this is in the re-edition of Shout in 2002. And in the introduction, he says, well, I had been criticized in the original edition of being biased against Paul, and I admit now that my depiction of him was unfair. Then, a few years later, you have him in an interview with The Guardian, and Norman says, yes, my depiction was unfair, but at this point he attempts to justify it by saying, I didn't like Paul's persona or music in the 1970s, particularly the late 1970s, which is when he's writing Shout. Then you have in the afterword of the Lennon biography, Norman claiming that the belief that he is anti-Paul is completely untrue. (laughs) So we're going through a whole lot of different versions. Then you have his promotion of his book on Paul, Mm. and he claims that he was actually a big fan of Paul. Initially in the Beatles days, Paul was his favorite Beatle but he felt betrayed by what he perceived as Paul's actions in breaking up the band, as well as Paul's leaving Jane and taking up with Linda, and that that prompted his unfair depiction of Paul. The issue with all of those for me, as an historian looking at Norman's arguments, is ideally, if his goal is to give us the most accurate version of the Beatles possible, his personal feelings about Paul should not have mattered one bit. Once he sat down to write the book, if he found himself incapable of analyzing the evidence objectively, then ideally he shouldn't have written the book at all. Did you ever listen to the podcast that something about the Beatles did about Philip Norman's book on Paul? Yes, I did. I mean, it's hilarious. Philip Norman saying, um, what did he say? Something like, um, 
Yeah, American journalists are a bit too worried about facts. I think uh, we shouldn't worry too much about facts. And uh, in England, we're much more in we're much more interested in uh, you know good writing, good solid writing. And uh, you know, he didn't say it in so many words, but like flowery narratives, basically. You know, flowery descriptions. <laughs> it's just a, what. It's interesting. I, I just did this podcast. I was telling you about um, a hard day's night, and it's a sort of comedic look at old films. But what was interesting is that the guys I did the podcast with they just said they were very casual Beatles fans and they were talking about Ringo and they said something interesting. They said, Oh, you know, Ringo's had this reputation as being the worst drummer in the world. And they said, Oh, is it right that in recent years, people have revised that a little bit. It's just very interesting that to Beatles fans, and I'm almost also a musician, you know, I've come to absolutely value. I mean, Ringo's work is spectacular. And now you've got isolated tracks so you can hear the drums on their own. It's very interesting. And the other one was obviously you've heard about this, misquote about someone apparently asking john lennon was ringo the best drummer in the world no he's not even the best drummer in the beatles that came from a guy called jasper carrot who's someone i used to watch on tv he's a guy who'd sit on a sofa just talking into the camera and he's very funny like dry humor but it must be so frustrating for a historian to just see how how these narratives just take so long to switch you know and the one we should really talk about since it's a john lennon podcast is the post-death martyrdom of john lennon so what's your read on that why is that so strong and prevailing still even 40 years after the fact i think again to reference a little bit about what we talked about in regards to the american civil war when you have for example the assassination of abraham lincoln and as i said prior to that assassination his press was very critical and I'm not saying he was universally critical that nobody said anything good about him, but he was criticized in the northern press, in the southern press, in the international press, really across the board in a lot of areas and for a lot of different reasons. But what you see is after he is murdered, it stops. And it stops for political reasons regarding the union. It stops for reasons of reconstruction. It stops because of guilt. There's a marvelous editorial from Punch the former British publication, I don't mm. think it's published anymore, where they actually write a eulogy for Abraham Lincoln and they admit in the eulogy that they were cruel and unkind to him and their depiction of him. But this, of course, is after his death. So you can see throughout history that when you get particularly the unexpected violent murder mm. of a famous individual, a lot of the focus then shifts towards remembering the good and omitting the bad if that is at all possible yeah i mean i'm not for i'm not all for immediately looking for the bad after someone's died and you know i don't i don't think that's in good taste but i don't think it's also good taste taste probably isn't the word but i don't think it's particularly useful historically to go the other way and just worship this guy and last year i pretty much abandoned social media except just to promote my podcast to be honest but um you know we saw last year on the 80th birthday Fan forums, I think, are in some ways highly disturbing in this, um, what's the word I'm looking for? This hagiography? Hagiography, that's it, yeah. And this worshipping and that I sometimes in my kind of mischievous way, I sometimes go onto forums and post a negative comment. Not, not a terrible comment, but I post a mild criticism to see what the response is. And I mean, you know, I'm part of a Stanley Kubrick group, a Lennon group, and I don't spend much time there. But when you post a negative comment, it's quite amazing what comes back you know 80 90 100 comments sometimes saying oh how can you do this how can you say this you know john was this john was that and this personalization as well and i'm sure i went through that you know when i was a teenager in my 20s this feeling that you know john lennon was speaking to you somehow particularly as a young man you know and uh particularly if you've got some of the rebellious spirit you know you never really get that with paul mccartney you never feel like that as a, as a young man you don't feel like Paul McCartney speaking to you, he seems almost more of an adult and John Lennon's more of an angsty teenager, which he kind of still was even when he was 40, let's be honest. But um, yeah, where was I going with that? Yeah, so also it's the manner of the death as well, obviously. It's the same as with terrorist attacks. It, again, if we take a couple of examples, 9-11, the visceralness of it and the, the fact that we can obviously see what was happening. If you compare that with, let's say, the Asian tsunami of 2004 which killed way more people but that was a natural disaster it didn't have that destructive element so i think mm -hmm. the manner of his death was a big part of that i know one of the things you wanted to talk about was and if i'm skipping too far ahead then let me know mm. the various biases that we bring in simply as we process information and mm. 
in some of the research I did for this podcast, as well as for my book, I was reading about essentially what we do when we process information, especially information when you have diverging opinions. And just what we do as a, as human beings with that information is if we have a diverging opinion, we either move towards the consensus. So we go towards what the majority of the group is saying, mm. or we ostracize the people who don't agree with what we're saying. Then eventually we just form entrenched factions where you have one polarized group and another polarized group. I think they've also done studies. People are not inclined to change their views on things regardless of the information they receive, which is a very dispiriting thing to know, because when people are confronted with evidence that contradicts what they prefer to believe, then what they choose to do then is disbelieve the evidence or argue that it's not methodologically sound. So it's most unfortunate. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, objectivity is almost, it's almost a myth at this point, you know, because you're absolutely right. And I mean, this podcast has a, has a psychology kind of bent to it. So it's one of my big interests. There's some evidence that the brain actually filters information out and that right. you, know, you get signals in the brain and essentially your brain repels things that, that you don't want to hear. That's why, you know, we like to all think we're rational, but we're not actually that re- we're not as reliable as we think. And our memory is not reliable as we think. So I'm absolutely on board with that. And um, a couple of terms that you'll be aware of that I just want to make the listeners aware of. One of them is cognitive dissonance, mm-hmm. which is essentially where, you know, you receive information that goes against your entrenched beliefs, or I would argue your conditioning. You know, we can argue the, the semantics of that. And the other one is cognitive bias, as you were saying, which is basically where you look for things. No, not cognitive bias. Sorry, confirmation bias, mm-hmm. where you essentially look for opinions that reflect your own to validate your own opinions. And nowadays, of course, with the internet, we've got, you can just join a forum. You know, if you're a liberal, you can join a very liberal oriented political forum, conservative, left wing, right wing, you know, you've got everything. If you want to hear people slagging off Paul McCartney and saying John Lennon was three quarters of the Beatles, there's plenty of John Lennon forums that will do that for you. (laughs) So, (laughs) Well, and it's interesting you bring that up because certainly one of the quotes that I use in my book, and it's dealing primarily then with history and certainly not with the internet, but it absolutely applies to looking at evidence on the internet, is that you cannot go into writing a history with a predetermined thesis. A good historian does not do that. What you do is you do not marshal evidence to fit a predetermined thesis. Instead, you gather your evidence and then you form your thesis as you examine and see what that evidence tells you. And I think the problem is, again, something that's intensified by the internet is we have confirmation bias and also selection bias, Mm -hmm. where you simply refuse to acknowledge or even expose yourself to sources that may contradict what you prefer to believe. And unfortunately, that's going to put you in an information bubble and My goal, at least in regards to Beatles historiography, is always what is going to get me the most accurate version of the band. And selection bias is not going to do that. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So everybody, so you kind of, people have got it the wrong way around. One of the things I was going to say about news, and we were talking about that, with 24-hour rolling news, what's happened is that the emphasis has flipped because if you think about news in a pure form, something happens and then you create a news item about it. But now with 24 hour news, it's the other way around. You've got 24 hours of news to fill. So now suddenly you're looking for stories. So it Mm -hmm. it gets flipped. It's the wrong way around. Yeah. It's not useful at all. Is it to finding the truth? Um, No. Yeah. Actually the narrative that I did want to, the the one that wasn't so clear to me was the Mark Lewis narrative. So I've, I've heard you talk about, and, and I agree with you, that Mark Lewison has really raised the bar. I mean, with his, mm-hmm. in his words, obsessive research. I mean, he read every edition of the Liverpool Echo. I can't remember how many years. I think it was 15 years worth, every single page, I think he said. But can you tell me exactly what you mean by the Lewison narrative? Is it a narrative about which Beatle was the most significant? Or can you just flesh that out for me, if you don't mind? Sure. The Lewison narrative is chronologically following the shout narrative and the contrast the primary contrast with the lewison narrative would be number one that you do have a 
shift in the interpretations and the conclusions on what I regard as the two major debates in Beatles historiography. Because certainly what you got in Lennon Remembers and Shout on the two great debates, and I don't think I explained what those were, the first is who broke up the band. And the second is who was the greater genius, who was the genius, who was more important to the band, however you want to phrase that. And certainly in the Lennon Remembers and the Shout narratives, the answer to those questions was Paul broke up the band for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And John was the only genius in the band. And what you get in the Lewison narrative, in part as a consequence of historical distance, also because of primary source evidence that comes out, and also because of Paul arguing his version of events Mm. is the answers to those questions shift. And I think Mm. what you see as the response to who broke up the band, the blame is no longer solely or primarily placed on Paul. He certainly identified as one of the factors, but not the primary factor. There's more than enough blame to go around is the Mm. argument that seems to be the consensus now in Beatles historiography. And the second argument regarding the issue of genius is that by the time we get to the middle, I'd say, of the Lewiston narrative, and also currently, we have this acknowledgement that John was a genius, Paul was also a genius, they had various strengths musically, but it's certainly a more equitable interpretation of the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership than you had in the Lennon Remembers and the Shout narratives. And also one of the distinguishing factors of the Lucid narrative, I would argue, is that we do get simply more attention and research devoted to George, to Ringo, to George Martin, and other crucial figures in Beatles historiography because both the Lennon Remembers and the Shout narratives diminish their contributions Again, to an astonishing extent. Yeah, I agree that he's equaled it out. It's funny that, I mean, I've been a Beatles fan since I was 13 or 14, which is now 30 years. And the interesting thing is that within a year of studying them, you know, I had like a, you know, a one year immersion, basically, you know, of just Mm -hmm. all the albums, all the books at that point, or all the ones that I thought were worth reading, you know, all the documentaries. And the interesting thing is that when I was 15, the magic of Lennon and McCartney was that to me, they were just perfectly equal. Mm -hmm. You know, George Martin had a great quote was that to John Lennon songwriting was words that needed music. And to Paul McCartney songwriting was music that needed words. I had never heard that quote before. Where did that come from? There was a radio documentary called in my life, Lennon remembered. And I managed to download it from somewhere, but it was on the radio in 1990 when I was 15 and I just remember I recorded it, you know, the good old days with your, with your cassette <laughs> recording stuff off the radio, if anyone can remember mm-hmm. that. Oh, you know, I did that. Oh, we all did that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I recorded it off the radio and, and I just listened to it. Oh, you can't even imagine how many times I listened to all those things, you know, all the document, watched all the documentaries. I was one of those kids. And uh, I thought that was a great quote. And, it, and he made it clear that that wasn't all they were, you know. Right. As the Beatles producer, George Martin was perfectly placed to observe the songwriting characteristics of John Lennon and Paul McCartney. John didn't give a damn what anybody thought. Paul did. Paul wanted people to think he was nice. Didn't matter to John. And that came out in their work, too, because Paul would tend to write music that was acceptable. John didn't give a damn. He would write music that he thought was right. And if people didn't like it, tough on them. And that was the kind of attitude that permeated both their writings. So this is probably why Paul, in truth, has written much more commercial music than John and written some of the best melodies of this century. You know, when you think of all the wealth of material that Paul has written, if you look at under Lennon McCartney, there's a great preponderance of Paul songs in that catalogue which have achieved sales so that um, if you were to divide them into John and Paul songs Paul would be much wealthier than John so in fact John earned a lot off Paul's back if you like on the other hand John was much more of a word merchant I think Paul always tended to think of his songs as being music to which he would put lyrics whereas I think John tended to think of an idea and a lyric which had to have a, a piece of music attached to it but they were both complete writers, of course. One wasn't the lyric man and one wasn't the music writer. But I think the emphasis was complementary. Now, Paul would 
helped John musically uh, because I think that he had a greater understanding of the theory of music and harmony and so on and he would be able to make a thing more well-rounded. John tended to drive the car without a clutch rather. He'd just go from one gear to another. On the other hand, again, John would have perhaps some more of a mastery of imagery in, in words and would make Paul work harder at his lyrics. We heard all these silly interviews, even up to 1966, when the reporters are saying, do you write the words or do you do the music? And it's like, have you not been listening to them t- saying for the last three years that they don't right. do that? You know, mm-hmm. it's just so frustrating. But um, that was his take. But I mean, they were they were perfectly equal. And in fact, Aaron, I'm going to make a controversial statement at the risk of alienating my enormous fan base. I actually think John Lennon was a tiny, tiny bit overrated. Let me explain, listeners, before you... Uh, shut off your computer in disgust. You've talked about the Many Years From Now book, and I recently read that because I will eventually do a podcast about that. And yes, you know, that is pushing a narrative. But unless Paul McCartney is lying through his teeth, which I don't believe he is, so many of the songs that we ascribe to John Lennon were actually co-writes. The one I want to talk to you about in a minute is In My Life, but let's think of some examples Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, you know, everyone will say, that's a John song, you know, it's got the imagery, Alice in Wonderland, you know, amazingly, Paul McCartney read Alice in Wonderland as well, and Paul McCartney was quite psychedelic, you know, and I mean, there's so many others, and I just did a show where we ranked the John Lennon albums, including his contributions to Beatles albums, and it was a fun show, but it was amazing how many, how I had to sort of check myself and say, well, that wasn't actually a John song, that may have been a 50-50 or a 60-40, and the one uh, that I know you talked about with Robert is in my life. Well, the one I studied in my book, the one I laid out in my book is Eleanor Rigby. Oh, okay. Right. So yeah, yeah, because that's the one we have those two songs whose primary authorship is disputed and in my life and Eleanor Rigby. And the reason I focused on Eleanor Rigby is because we have so many witnesses that provide evidence in the dispute and all of those witnesses attest in favor of Paul being the Mm. primary author. In My Life is a book that I really haven't examined the same way I did Eleanor Rigby because Mm. so far as I have seen in my research, we don't have those sources. Instead, what we have is we have John saying one thing and we have Paul saying another. Mm. And we have them saying this and doing this at different times. And the other issue within my life is that I am not a musician Mm. and I'm not trained in music. And so it was much easier to evaluate the sources discussing Eleanor Rigby than it is because, of course, the the contention in my life, is it a 50-50 song because Paul would have written all of the melody and John would have written all of the lyrics? I am not qualified to analyze melody. I mean, I feel like I am a little bit because I'm a musician. I've not studied music theory, but I know enough to know that if you play that melody on the piano, the range of the melody does not fit almost any John Lennon songs. John Lennon solo songs and the ones that we know are John Lennon-led Beatles songs, his genius was basically taking a melody that could be, you know, the the thing about Three Blind Mice, you know, that tune, All You Need Is Love, Instant Karma, My Mummy's Dead, they're basically the Three Blind Mice chords, melody, Mm -hmm. variations of. And his genius was what he put underneath those to sort of validate these very childlike and simple melodies. But the In My Life melody, I mean, you know, I think most musicians would back me up if they study it. And, you know, it could be an anomaly. You know, it might have been John Lennon, but I just tend to go with the fact that having done this podcast, I just don't really trust John Lennon's word particularly. I think there's a really overlooked part of the partnership where they were so influenced by one another that, that bled into their work. And there's a great quote, for example, on Eleanor Rigby from George Martin in the authorized biography. It's another piece of evidence indicating that Paul was the primary author of that song, Mm. where he says that Paul wouldn't have worked on the lyrics. And this isn't isn't an exact quote, but Paul wouldn't have worked as hard on the lyrics as he did if it weren't for John's influence. So, If you want to go with the assumption that John was correct when he said that he wrote most of the melody, then you can also make the analysis that that is not a melody that John would have written without Paul's melodic influence. Yeah, I agree with you up to a point, but I feel like they probably, 
Paul would have influenced John to work harder at his music and John would have influenced Paul to work harder at his lyrics, but I don't think that would necessarily change their style. I would go more just that it would be better. Again, go on, getting go on. into the issue, the, the details of music is something that is very precarious for me. I, I right, try not right. to go too far down that road, but I am reminded of that quote from John in 1969 where he says, you know, I wouldn't write the way I do if it weren't for Paul and he wouldn't write the way he does if it weren't for me. Yeah, I'm just, um, I mean, I'm not clear on it myself, you know, whether the distinction is just working harder or actually changing your style, but mm -hmm. I just can't see John Lennon writing Eleanor Rigby because that's what he attacked, you know, Paul writing right. these silly songs with these third person characters. Mm -hmm. It's like, why would he suddenly do that? And I'm not ruling it out. You know, it could be an anomaly, you know, the world's full of anomalies. So, you know. Well, see, and the, the fascinating thing for me about Eleanor Rigby is after sifting through the evidence, the reality is that we have no evidence supporting John's claims to authorship, and we have numerous eyewitnesses talking about watching Paul writing the song. So my conclusion, methodologically, is that Paul wrote the song. So the far more interesting question to me is then why did John claim that he wrote the lyrics or 70% of the lyrics to Eleanor Rigby? That's what really gets me curious. Yeah, I mean, I can't really answer that, but I could say that I would say John was the more unreliable of the two narrators. Well, that's what Pete Shotton says in his discussion on right. Eleanor Rigby. Shotton says that the reason, presumably, that John claimed primary authorship is a poor memory. Yeah, I mean, and again, we're going to get onto my favorite topic in a minute. I'm going to tease the audience a bit first. You know, having having read and studied John Lennon so much, and with the heroin and the primal therapy. And what I believe is the narrative of his later life, I think, you know, he, he had quite deep psychological complexes. I did have a therapist on the show last year who made pains to say, you know, I don't want to diagnose John Lennon 40 years later, having never met him. Right. But he, he outlined some basic stuff to do with childhood trauma. And all I'm going to say is I just believe John was a very unreliable narrator. And, um, you know, that's no great news flash because I think anyone who studies him knows that already. But, uh, yeah, looking at the contentious versions of John Lennon's last five years, and Aaron, just for a second, I'm just going to give the audience a couple of seconds to guess what I'm about to say. Are you ready, audience? One, two, three. Yes, it's Coleman and Goldman. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm only saying that because we've covered this quite extensively on the show, but I, I still think there's more to say, partly because I actually decided uh, I'm going to be on this podcast, Let It Roll, that you were on. I actually decided to read the Golden Book in its entirety, and I just did that the last couple of weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah, and um, I'll just give my brief observations, and then I'll throw to you. What I found with the book, there were a lot of inaccuracies. However, it was written in 1988, and you have to forgive the fact that there has been 30 years more research. And what's so interesting with history, of course, is that history is fluid. Although the events haven't changed, it feels like they've changed because they're constantly being revised. And I'll just give you a little example. The Joe Gooden book, which I know you enjoy, The Beatles and Drugs, did a review of that. It's since come out in the last couple of years that Paul took LSD in December 1965, right. rather than autumn 66, which was what we thought before. Now, that, that might not seem like a big thing, but now we know that he had taken LSD when Revolver was made, which changes the whole dynamics of, you know, what are the songs about? Mm -hmm. you know, so these things which seem rather innocuous, especially when you're talking about world wars and things, they are important in our little Beatle world, you know? <laughs> so I read the Goldman book and um, yeah, there's a lot of inaccuracies. There's a lot of conjecture, but what I find interesting is that a lot of people who dismiss the book, they all say the same thing. They say his, um, his research was, they always use words like flawless and impeccable, but then they say, Oh, but he sp spun things. But the thing is, what they're essentially saying is that what's in his book is true. It just has a certain angle. But, you know, there were lots of fairly scandalous things that a lot of John Lennon fans wouldn't even want to entertain, especially mm -hmm. with this memory we have of John Lennon. So let's talk about um, just the books in turn. So could you just, just your thoughts on uh, Coleman and then Goldman? Well, Coleman is published in three different editions. So I think the... Initial edition, I think it comes out a year earlier in the UK. So it comes out, I think, in 83 in the UK and 84 in the United States. And then you have another edition in 1992. And then you have, so far as I know, the last edition that was issued, and that was in 2000. And, of course, Goldman is published in 88 and has had no re-editions or revised editions. 
the reality is, is that if you look at those books purely from a methodological standpoint, you take away the emotion of the analyzer, then they're really about the equivalent of one another in terms of their methodological flaws. Neither of them has a bibliography, although Goldman does provide a list of his interviewees, which is more than Coleman does. Coleman does not give us that. Neither of them have citations in the text, and so that means that you will have quotes or pieces of supposedly evidence that are offered by either author, but then you can't look back to see who's saying it or when they're saying it or what the time period was, any of those issues. And that also means that you can't distinguish authorial editorializing from what the evidence is, what people are saying. And so that's an issue. Both of them choose evidence to fit that predetermined thesis that they went into with. Now, Goldman's interpretation of John is obviously more negative, but Coleman's in certain parts is geographic. It's, it's the polar opposite of what you have. Both of them portray more favorably sources who gave them interviews. Both of them, although Coleman in particular is guilty of this, apply source analysis only to the sources that disagree with their preferred version of events mm. and then don't bother to address any source analysis whatsoever with the individuals who support their version of events. And that's really just to begin. You have various instances with Coleman and Goldman with very serious methodological errors, errors of interpretation, errors of methodology, particularly that issue of bias in both cases and that mustering of evidence to fit that thesis that you have gone into the book with. Yeah, very interesting. So it's like, uh, yeah, two kind of very unreliable books at at each poles of the John Lennon narrative. And that's what makes them so striking. My experience as a Beatles fan, I don't know what yours in terms of reading their historiography is that as a third generation fan, I did not read anything in any particular type of order. Mm -hmm. I basically read what my local library branch had available Mm -hmm. and then following that, what my library system had available and then following that, what interlibrary loan had available. And what that means is that one day I read usually about two to three books a week. That's about how I average. So for one week, I might read Bronze book from, you know, 1964 yeah. and then turn around. And the next book I would read would be Summer of Love about Sgt. Pepper. And then the book I would read after that might be Peter Doggett and You Never Give Me Your Money. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that just happens to happen as I was going through Beatles historiography is that I read Coleman's Lennon biography about two weeks before I read Goldman's Uh, Lennon biography. And it's difficult to believe in certain, certain areas that they're about the same people. That's so funny. You said that you just taken the words out of my mouth because that's exactly what I said a couple of months ago on the show. Now I was being interviewed on another show and I was saying, yeah, when I was 14, I read Coleman and then uh, mine was probably, I don't know, six months later or something. I Mm -hmm. read Goldman. I'm like, how is this exactly the same as you? How is this the same person? I can't believe it. And it, it wasn't that I believed one over the other. And I was, I'd say I've always been a fairly open-minded person. And I didn't really judge either of them. I found the Coleman was such a compelling narrative because it was quite simple. I find the mainstream narratives are always a good starting point, you mm-hmm. know, because you've got some facts which are established and then you can kind of branch out to the more alternative air quotes. But uh, yeah, I was the same as you. I was like, I can't believe this. And um I did skim through the Coleman book because we actually did a, a program called Coleman or Goldman. I listened and, to that one. Oh, yes. you listened to that. Oh, thanks. Mm-hmm. That's great. And one of the things is that if you look at the chapter titles, if you take away the non-specific ones like Hamburg and art school, I mean, okay, most people don't have fame, but it's money, growing up, travel, whatever it is, you know, it's got these very, very simple titles. And the last five years, the way he deals with those in the light of, you know, what's come out since and the fact that he didn't revise them, as you said, I got the 2000 one, actually, I think someone bought it for me. I don't know why they thought I wanted to read it again, but that's another story. He didn't really revise that. I mean, he did a little bit, but then he he attacked Albert Goldman 
And there's a few things that were a bit valid. For example, you know the Bob Wooler incident from 1963. Okay. I just read the Goldman book, as I told you. And Albert Goldman has John Lennon picking up a shovel and basically beating Bob Wooler to death. Mm-hmm. And that could be the truth. I've never looked into it, to be honest. Uh, it's just I don't. I've never heard anyone else say that. The popular thing was that he, you know, started kicking his ribs. And we know John Lennon right. was a terrible drunk. There's yes. so much evidence of that. You can't possibly mm-hmm. dispute that. But um, the thing with Coleman, what it is, and this is what we are getting back to earlier about mainstream history, it's all just wrapped up in such a neat parcel. You know, it's all – John Lennon went through some troubles. I mean, obviously, I came up with a theory that if you read that book and you watch the Imagine 88 documentary, if you take away the murder, which obviously changed everything, what it is is basically a story of redemption. Mm-hmm. This guy goes through fame, he right. goes through drugs, and then magically at the age of 40, all his demons are gone. He's happy with his family, and isn't it lovely, all wrapped up in a parcel? And that's my issue with it. And just very briefly, I don't want to go to tangent, but this Ken Burns Vietnam documentary, it does this really, I think, deceptive trick of giving you this quite hard history at the beginning. And then, again, it just sort of ties it up in a parcel and said the the lesson that America learned from Vietnam was not to get involved in cultures and terrains and languages they didn't understand. And it's like, well, what have they been doing ever since? <laughs> like, have you ever heard of Afghanistan or Iraq? And it's like, what? Anyway, that's a tangent for another day. Just something else to keep in mind in regards to Coleman and Goldman mm. specifically, but also Beatles historiography overall, is they are contemporaries of one another. And they are using each other's research and they are commenting on one another. You have Goldman citing Coleman, using him as a source, but also criticizing him. And I can't remember whether it's in the text or whether it's in the introduction to the book or the afterward saying that parts of Coleman's interpretations are hagiographic or syncophantic, which, to be frank, is a valid criticism. Hmm. But, of course, he's Goldman, so he's in a glass house and he's throwing stones And he has his own errors of methodology. And then Coleman spends the introduction to really almost the entire 1992 introduction to the revised John biography attacking Albert Goldman. But it's not just that they're arguing over their versions of John, because when you have these two such extreme portrayals, one from Coleman, one from Goldman on opposite sides of the spectrum, it's also an issue of defending their own reputations. Because in regards to Goldman, what he uncovers is certainly negative aspects of John that were not anywhere near present in Coleman's version, which would say something about Coleman's research, or it would say something about his methods, the evidence he chose, the evidence he rejected, and the way he interpreted that evidence. And there are some areas of Coleman's interpretation where he twists himself into knots to not say anything critical about John. And one of the most blatant examples of this is in the introduction to the original version. And I'm not sure if it's in the introduction to the second and third versions. And Coleman is attempting to address John's acts of physical violence against men and occasionally also against women. And Coleman says something to the effect of, he lumps in also John's verbal assaults, whatever you would want to call them. Yeah. So he's he's lumping all this up into one big category. And Coleman's basic assessment of the entire situation is, yes, John could be violent, both physically and verbally. But I'm trying to remember the exact phrase. To be attacked by John Lennon brought fame of a kind. So yeah. his assessment of this very real struggle that John admitted and discussed was something he did not like about himself. Mm. Coleman's entire assessment of the situation is, well, if you were attacked by John Lennon, at least you became famous for a while. (laughs) Oh my God. And, And so you have Coleman again, twisting himself into trying to come up with these favorable interpretations, which is, not a methodological strength of his work. And of course, on the opposite side, we have Goldman making these leaps of logic, preferring the sensationalistic, preferring the negative, and having examples going the other way. You know, John visited Thailand. There are, what, male prostitutes in Thailand. Therefore, John presumably visited these prostitutes and used their services. 
so it's it's a reputational issue for the authors as well because their versions of John are at best incomplete. Yeah. And at worst, they were deliberately committing these methodological errors that undermine serious aspects of their work. Right. God, it's so fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I, I felt like we'd put this issue to bed like a few months ago, but it's just so rich because it's just the idea of these opposite narratives. It's just mm-hmm. mind blowing. So you said you listened to the Coleman or Goldman, the episode we did. So the, I made a new friend last year, Caitlin, who was mm-hmm. um, Sean Lennon's playmate, if you remember. I told Caitlin that she seems to get mentioned all the time now, and I, I don't want to feel like I'm using her as some sort of a mascot. You know, my she was there, you know, my, mm-hmm. my witness, because she keeps saying, to, oh, I'm so sorry I wasn't older. She was like a few months older than Sean. She's saying, oh, I'm so sorry I wasn't born earlier. I could have some better memories. But it's interesting, and, and she's, she said that she doesn't mind me saying stuff that she's told me off the record, so to speak, because we recorded a follow-up. But she said John Lennon as a father was – more or less the John Lennon that Goldman portrays in that he'd be very enthusiastic for about five minutes. You can imagine this. You you can imagine John Lennon as this kind of childlike, very very charismatic, but very Mm -hmm. unreliable kind of guy. And she said, you know, it's totally true. He'd be into it for five minutes. And then he just suddenly like, Oh, this is fucking boring, you know, and he'd disappear off into his room. And we don't know if he was smoking weed, doing heroin. It probably doesn't really matter, but it's interesting that, the more I find out the continuum that I've established, the truth is inching towards the Goldman version. And I mean, do you have a gut feeling taking off your historia? Historiographical? Yeah. I was going to say historian. That'd be easier. Yeah. Do you have any uh, kind of gut feelings about what the truth is there? I think there are two things to really talk about. And number one so I'm not entirely taking off my historian's hat, okay. but what methodology tells us when we get to a conflict like this, where we have these differing sources offering one version of events and then other sources really of approximately equal credibility offering a second version, then what you are supposed to do is one historian says use common sense and then another one says use rational thinking which basically what you just called going with your gut. Mm. And my examination is that from what we have seen of John Lennon's past, this was a man who struggled with addictive issues. This was a man who struggled with self-control, with his temper, and also conflicted feelings regarding parenting. Mm. And That's the basic stuff that he struggled with. Again, this was also an individual who experienced a level of fame that the rest of us, thankfully, will never be exposed to and will never have to deal with. But I find it simplistic to argue that all of these issues that he had struggled with his entire life, because we have evidence from his childhood, his adolescence, all of the different Beatles periods of again, issues with depression that he had to deal with. I find it simplistic to argue that all of these issues that had existed throughout the entirety of his existence simply vanished. They just floated away in the clouds. For the last five years of his life. Yes. So the second part of that would be my estimation when you're dealing with the last five years of John Lennon's life. And frankly, I should have done a better job of explaining this in my book is I think the debate you're really having is one of percentage or proportion. Yes. So are we talking about John being unhappy 60% of the time and happy Mm -hmm. 40% of the time? Is it 80, 20? Is it 20, 80? And when we get into the weeds like that, unless we get new primary sources, then I don't think that's a debate that you can really settle definitively with the evidence that we have right now. Yeah. I mean, it's more of an interesting debate, I think. So I like having guests on the show to ask them. I mean, obviously the other guests I have are not historians, Mm -hmm. so they're more, um, what do you think? But actually talking a lot to Caitlin, as I have done in the last year, I mean, she is a primary source. She was a four-year-old child, (laughs) five-year-old child, which compromises it somewhat. But It does. uh, It does. The the age of the individual and i guess what you could call their level of expertise there are some things obviously that she is not going to understand in regards to drug use hopefully at age four (laughs) she may have been very Um, precocious yeah who knows but yeah yes yes 
So that does matter, the degree of attention. And as I appreciated one of the aspects of her interview when I listened to it, that she was very free to admit, you know, I wasn't around for this. I didn't Mm. understand this. I was very young. I spent most of my time playing with Sean. So she doesn't present herself as being this all-knowing primary source, although she absolutely is one. Well, we recorded a follow-up, which would like to be released in March, so I'll send that to you anyway, and that'd be <laughs> interesting. Yeah, because um, her mother, Marnie Hare, was basically Albert Goldman's main source for the Dakota, along with Fred Seaman. And um, Caitlin, for example, speaks very highly of Fred. You know, mm-hmm. she didn't know what happened with her diary. She was too young. Right. But... Um, This thing about, like I said earlier, about history being fluid. I mean, I'm just reading Julia Baird's book. Imagine this. Julia Baird, John Lennon's half-sister, has written two books. Hopefully I'll be speaking to her in the future. And I'm just reading it, and Aunt Mimi comes across as, frankly, just a terrible person. I mean, you know, people who do bad acts, there's generally always a reason. So, you know, you can't totally judge. But, you know, this sort of glorification of Aunt Mimi, uh, uh, you know, this sweet old lady who took in John Lennon. I don't know if you've read that book, but, Julia Baird's narrative is that basically Mimi wrestled John away from Julia and the fact that Julia had got pregnant, she'd had this baby that, you know, was adopted by this Norwegian couple. And then uh, Alf Lennon was obviously considered very unsuitable by the Stanley Mm -hmm. family who were a little bit kind of hoity-toity and thought themselves a a bit middle class and above the Liverpool scallies, you know. So they wrestled John away. And then when Julia Lennon died, according to Julia Baird, Julia and Jackie, the two half sisters, weren't told. They were just spirited away to Scotland. They didn't hear about their mother's death for two months. And then they, they were told in no uncertain terms that they were a pain. We don't want your children. You're not part of the family because their only parent that was left was John Dykins, you right. know, and he wasn't one of the Stanleys. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, for a historian, like I said earlier, it must, it must be maddening, but also very interesting because there's always going to be a story, right? And I'm sure, you know, obviously the people involved with the Beatles, they're all, you know, they're not going to be around forever, unfortunately. And I managed to speak to two of the quarrymen. And one of the things that they debunked was the idea that John Lennon got into lots of fights when he was a teenager. Colin Hanton, you know, who was the drummer with the quarrymen. I went to his house in Liverpool last year, had a lovely two hours chatting with him. And he showed me lots of original photos he had. He said, no, no, John Lennon would talk himself out of trouble. And the quarrymen spent a lot of time running away from Teddy boys, you know, Mm -hmm. which... As I said to him at the time, I don't blame him because Teddy Boys, you know, this is serious stuff. They'd have like razor blades on their lapels and right. they'd come armed with all kinds of things, you know, knives and so forth. But, you know, it is so interesting with history, isn't it, is that we're never really going to get to the bottom of it. And poor old Mr. Lewis, and since Tune In came out, I'm sure he's found loads of stuff that he didn't oh. put in his books, you know? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. that's one of the things I want to stress to anybody listening to the podcast is that mm. we always have new evidence coming out. Or, again, interpretations are always going to be impacted by the author, even if the author is attempting to be as objective as possible. Mm. And so what always interests me when a new Beatles book comes out is not necessarily the authorial interpretation, because, frankly, that's the less important part of the puzzle, but the evidence they offer. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that you wanted to talk about was John Lennon's relationship with the press. And I think we've touched on this, but um, give us just what's your interpretation or any observations you'd like to make? Well, I think I may have mentioned this on the something about the Beatles podcast, Mm. the first or the second one I did. But, you know, going into Beatles historiography first as a fan and reading the biographies, the group biographies, individual biographies, all of those sort of things is you had this very clear image, and it comes from people like Philip Norman, it comes from authors that I prefer more than Norman, like Nicholas Schaffner. I do like Schaffner's work in terms of The Beatles Forever, but I also believe he is very hamstrung by the time period in which he writes. Ray Coleman is another, but it's also spread beyond those core authors into really across Beatles historiography. We have this image of Paul as the PR guy and John as the honest truth teller and the one who has the guts to make controversial statements, as well as the one who is not, he's not courting the press. He's just telling the truth in the interpretation of a lot of these authors. And what you have instead, when you look at, again, the amounts of interviews that they're giving, particularly in the breakup period, to skip back just a minute, it's, it's very valid 
to call Paul a PR guy. I want to make that very clear. He calls himself a PR guy right. various times in the Beatles period. He gives many interviews in the Beatles period. He gives many, many interviews later. But when you look at the breakup period, there's a six to one ratio of interviews coming from John and Yoko to Paul's interviews. Wow. And Paul's not giving interviews that are anywhere near anything in scope or emotion or detail compared to what John and Yoko are offering with the Lennon Remembers interview or the St. Regis interview. So that was very striking to me because, again, I had been given this accepted wisdom that Paul is the PR guy and John is not. Mm. Whereas if you look at the breakup period, that's simply incorrect. There's really no other way to interpret the evidence yeah. than that John and Yoko were deliberately engaging in a PR offensive. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. I thought it was very savvy of them. But to ignore the existence of the PR component of John and Yoko was something that I found very curious because once you dig a little deeper, it's very obviously there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the Andy Peebles interview is a very good example. You know, this famous interview that he did 6th of December, 1980. I've talked about this many times, but uh, interestingly, I did see an article that came out, I think it was about 2005, I think it was 25 years after John died. And it was Andy Peebles that actually revised his opinion of uh, John and Yoko's relationship, partly due to some correspondence he's had with Yoko. Now, I want to make it clear that this, um, this story was in The Sun, which is, <laughs> yeah. which is our uh, shameful, horrible tabloid we have here in England <laughs> that outsells all the other newspapers by uh, far too much. Anyway, but it was interesting that he, he actually felt, in retrospect, that he had been part of a kind of a performance and um you know i think john did have this charisma and i think if you are famous um, i've never been famous by the way but uh, and you get to deal with the press and people you develop these kind of skills and you know the verbal skills you also develop these sort of compartmentalization skills because one of the things in may pang's book i think it was around the time of mind games it must have been it was when they first got together and they went to los angeles and he was doing PR for mind games. Mm -hmm. They had some sort of blazing row and John did something quite nasty or he said something nasty to her. And she said, uh, and I haven't read this book for years, by the way, but I remember this. She said, you know, almost in the same breath, five minutes later, he was doing a radio interview for mind games. And May Pang said he just came across as the most charismatic, lucid, full of all great stories. You know, there's Dennis Elsis, that great interview he did in 74. And that he was able to just turn it on and off like a tap. And I think that's partly, you know, I'm sure he had verbal skills when he was a child, but it comes a lot with this playing the media game and being famous. You must develop these skills that mere mortals, let's say, don't have, you know? Absolutely. Mm. And I think that issue of John Lennon's charisma, it's frustrating because it's not something that can be measured or really comes across mm. the page. But you have so many quotes from so many individuals who encountered him that his charisma, his personal charisma, simply must have been off the charts in not just his dealings with reporters, but also even with the other Beatles, his position in the Beatles hierarchy, how they all admired him and they all discussed how much they admired him and looked up to him. Yeah. But that issue with reporters also matters a great deal because, you know, you have Peebles talking about it and he would be an example, but other reporters too because really, if you're a reporter and you do one of these interviews with John Lennon and he gives you his version of events, mm. then you promote it as this is John's story. This is the true story of the Beatles, et cetera. And later on, John contradicts himself or argues against it. Then you really only have a few options of what you, the reporter, can do or how you see that interview. Either A... John was using you as a propagandist mm. or using you to blow off steam, as May Peng says, or B, then John Lennon gave you an authentic interview and gave you the truth. You were the interview who, interviewer who managed to ask the questions that yeah. got below the surface and discovered the truth of John Lennon and the Beatles. And if you are that journalist, which version of events are you going to want to prefer for yourself? Are you the propagandist who got duped? Or are you the intelligent journalist who got to the truth? Yeah, I mean, there's other people from around that time that I kind of read a lot of autobi of um, biographies of 
you know, Elvis Presley, for example, Muhammad Ali was another one. They're so charismatic that even a hard bitten reporter, cynical reporter can get swept up in this thing. You know, it's quite amazing. To divert just a little bit, we have an example of this in regards to Paul. And I don't think that Paul's charisma is quite on the same level as John's, although we do have many people who will also attest to his charisma and intelligence. And there's an interview done by Joan Goodman, the Playboy interview in in 1984. And she prefaces it by saying that she had been told by other journalists that essentially Paul was not very intelligent that John was the intelligent beetle, that John was the arty beetle, and that she shouldn't let herself get duped by Paul. And then throughout the course of the interview, Joan found herself believing many of the things Paul said, or at least disavowing this idea that he was not intelligent or artistic. Mm. Mm. So that, again, would deal with that ability of these famous individuals to influence the people who are interviewing them. Yeah, I think the problem with Paul is that I agree with you. I just did a show on um, another podcast about uh, the 70s, John and Paul in the 70s. And it's interesting that this idea that Paul needed the Beatles more than the others, I think that's true around the Let It Be period, you know, the Get Back sessions. But it's interesting that obviously Paul sued the other three to dissolve the Beatles' partnership. And he made it fairly clear. He did a few interviews, 71, 72. He made it fairly clear that he wanted out. He's like, okay, I've accepted that this group is over. Let's get this thing over. Mm -hmm. So this whole perception that he spent the 70s, you know, trailing after John Lennon like a puppy dog, you know, turning up at his house with a guitar or with a bag of weed or something. I'm sure that happened a couple of times, but (laughs) it's just so fascinating that certain narratives are so strong in people's minds that, you know, unless you actually study them, they just get so ingrained. It's amazing. But um, with John Lennon and the press, I think the thing that fascinates me is the bedding. And he makes it perfectly clear that he said, we're selling peace like you sell soap. You know, we're advertising peace. And what's fascinating about those uh, interviews they did is that essentially they're using what's now called the mainstream media, which in those days was just called the media because there wasn't really much alternative. He's using the establishment media to rail against the establishment. And it's just fascinating because he knows that the reporters are not going to stop him because it's a great story and that they're going to hang on his every word. And, you know, there were stories that, you know, the reporters thought there was going to be something racy going on in the hotel room and all they found was two people in pajamas talking about peace, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this interesting thing where he wasn't really hiding the fact that he used the press. It's bizarre. Stay in bed. Dry your hair. Bed piece. Hair piece. Hair piece, bed piece. Stay in bed and grow your hair. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I think it's Pete Shotton who also says that John told him, and I don't know if we have verification on this from other sources, but Pete says that John told him that part of the aspect of the, the peace campaign was just, you know, riling people up. Right, yeah. And the fact getting that... Them, getting them upset, getting them angry, getting them interested... And I mean, the fact that these phases of his life never lasted very long. Uh, like I said, I just read Goldman and, you know, he overplays almost everything. The, the same way that Coleman underplays exactly what you said, you know, mm-hmm. on this continuum, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, inching towards Goldman. Anyway, and they talk about that John Yoko's peace period was incredibly short. You know, I mean, I think it's fair to say that John Lennon probably had a nervous breakdown around 1970 i would go along with that and then he had the primal therapy so he was kind of out of action he had the um immigration case they had the stuff with kyoko i mean he had so much going on that i don't blame him for perhaps not being able to focus but you know he had the peace period then he had the new left anti-war activism and then that pretty much got dropped very quickly so i think the picture you get is of a guy who did attach himself to causes and a, this is not me saying this, but a psychologist would say that a lot of traumatized people do tend to do that. You hmm. know, they want I didn't to, know that. Yeah, they tend to, um, you know, because they have, you know, I'm sure we all have kind of gaps in our, in our psyche. You know, we all have a certain emptiness or whatever that could be just from the human condition. But I think traumatized people, they have like a bigger hole to fill. So they tend to, I don't know, John Lennon's theory was that he became famous because he needed it more than most people. You know that? You know, and that's him playing, you know, a coffee table psychologist. So they, they would tend to perhaps attach themselves to causes because they want to do something big in their lives, mm-hmm. you know, and that normal life is just too boring. And 
Goldman had some great psychological insights into John Lennon. That was one of the big strengths of his book. I do think for people who don't want to bother reading Goldman at all or refuse to acknowledge Goldman, there are some issues there in that Goldman's research is not going to vanish from Beatles historiography. And in Mm. fact, what we've seen in about the last 10, 15 years is that an increasing number of authors who have good reputations and also demonstrate Mm. sound methodology are incorporating increasing amounts of Goldman's research into their own work because you have Peter Doggett who incorporates some of Goldman's evidence and interpretations into his work. Or you have Lewison in an interview he gave a few years ago, and I can't remember when it was. I just remember it was in the halls of the British Library where Lewison also praises Goldman's research while also, as Doggett did, as Spitz has done, acknowledge that he pre-selected evidence to fit his thesis, that he veered toward the sensationalistic and the negative. So you can choose, certainly as a reader, not to read Goldman, but it's not going to go away. And a big part of that is because of the sources that Goldman found, and in particular that you can't ignore primary sources. You can analyze them, certainly, but you can't just ignore that they exist or what they say. Yeah. Do you see how we got we effortlessly got sucked back into Coleman Goldman, you see? Oh. So, com- <laughs> so compelling that, uh, all right. Should we do 10 more minutes? Sure, sure. I'd love to talk to you for longer, but um, <laughs> okay. It was amazing. We've covered like a fraction of the stuff that we were going to cover, but uh, it's all been fantastic. Yeah, I should have a question for you. I haven't read the latest Ray Connolly book. Was mm-hmm. it called Being John Lennon? And I read the Norman book from 2008. I don't remember there being anything particularly new in that, but was there anything you discovered from those books? Did they push the narrative forward at all? The Ray Connolly book, I think, is distinguished in that it's the first John biography of which I am aware where you have Ray really paying due attention to both versions of the last five years of John's life, as well as looking at various versions of, for example, The Lost Weekend, because certainly one of the errors, Norman's biography of John was one of the first Beatles books I read when I was a casual fan before I was thinking of writing a book of my own. And I remember reading it again the way I read all nonfiction, which is as a history professor, somebody who grades history papers. Mm -hmm. And the chapter on The Lost Weekend, and this was really the, the first or second exposure I'd ever had to the discussion of the topic, I remember being struck by how the source that Norman keeps using for the depiction of The Lost Weekend is not so much May, but it's Elliot Mintz. And you have so many quotes from Elliot Mintz in this chapter. And I remember assessing this and thinking, well, number one, he's not there much of the time. And number two, there's not a diversity of sources. And what I mean by that is that, especially if you are dealing with a contradictory topic, then what you are supposed to do is use as many primary sources as you possibly can to give varying perspectives on this controversial subject. And I remember reading it and thinking, you know, if this were a research paper from one of my students, I would write diversify your sources (laughs) in the margins because we're only getting one perspective of this period. And obviously it has other perspectives. And that's even before you get to the complication that not only is it one perspective, it's a source that has some credibility issues. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard, um, this is kind of hearsay, but uh, Elliot Mintz is essentially Yoko's mouthpiece for, again, the official version. And May Pang, unfortunately, has been terribly airbrushed out of the Lennon uh, estate narrative, let's call it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a shame. What was I talking about? Lost my train of thought. Yeah, so, so Connolly, you're saying kind of took both ends of the continuum, the Coleman and Goldman, and incorporated both of them. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and that might not seem terribly radical, but again, as far as I know, it's the first John biography that really does that, because Norman certainly doesn't do that. Coleman Mm. does not do that. Goldman offers the other end of the extreme. Mm -hmm. So Connolly is really the first to lay it all out. The aspects of the Norman book that were, I guess, what you could call new, really have less to do with his interpretation of John than they do, again, of his interpretation of Paul. 
and right. the major debates in Beatles historiography, because what you see with Norman's biography of John is him inching away from his previous contemptuous dismissal. There's really no other way to say it. Even Norman has admitted that he yeah. was biased in his depiction of Paul, inching away from that depiction and really trying to gain reputation perhaps for greater objectivity on the subject of Paul McCartney. Because yeah. again, going back to that issue of authorial reputation, it's very difficult for you to establish yourself as one of the primary Beatles authors or Beatles authorities if you have been proven wrong in your interpretation on one of the two members of the Lennon-McCartney songwriting partnership. Right. So he wrote a long book about John almost with an agenda to revise his opinion of Paul. That's interesting. Well, yeah. and you see that, of course, taken further in his biography of Paul. It's very interesting if you right. read his biography of Paul, it's almost as if he went through shout and decided to portray the opposite of his interpretation of almost everything he said in shout, even down to certain songs. Yeah. Like in shout, I remember he dismisses Let It Be. He dismisses For No One, which is quite striking. Wow. And then you shift over to his biography of Paul and he has nothing but praise for those songs. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to put in the show notes. There's something about the Beatles when they did about Philip Norman, because it's, it's hilarious. It's just unbelievable. All right, Aaron, thank you so much. We've done uh, nearly two hours and I will be contacting you later this year to appear on my other podcast to talk about history and propaganda. And sure. you can talk about the Civil War as whichever topics you want to for as long as you want, because it's a fascinating topic. So your book is The Beatles and the Historians. And what's the name of your blog? The Historian and the Beatles. Ah, OK, right. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. All right. I'll put links to the show notes. Are you planning? I know you've got I know the children are deciding what happens in your life at the moment. But uh, do you feel like you might write any more Beatles related books in the future? I do. I think it will have to be something that won't even start for a good two to three years, right. basically until my youngest is in preschool, okay. because that's really the only way that the other book managed to happen and that I had a certain block of time in the afternoon where I could simply sit and write. So you'll be neck and neck with Mark Lewison in about four years. <laughs> I hope his next edition comes out before then. Oh, poor old Mark. Yeah. If I ever do speak to him, I'll make sure I don't answer that question. I, I say, I'll say, I'll make sure I don't ask that question. Anyway, yes, I'm sure he's getting peppered with it all the time. Yeah, I might ask him when part three is coming out, just so I can ask him something different. No, it's a joke. <laughs> anyway, thanks very much, and um, good luck with the family, and good luck with your writing in the future. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. So there you have it. That was episode 67. What a great guest Aaron was. And as well as her appearances on Something About the Beatles, Let It Roll, and Beatles Books, I've just seen actually this week as I'm putting this out, the One Sweet Dream podcast has just released their talk with Aaron as well. So you've got that one. I think that's part one of two. I think they had a very epic conversation. So I'm certainly really listening to that. Aaron's book is The Beatles and the Historians, and her blog is The Historian and the Beatles. Before I go, just a reminder, listener audio questions mp3 form send them to glass onion pod at yahoo.com and i look forward to those the next episode is going to be with a gentleman called alan parry who is a therapist from liverpool so therapist from liverpool and in fact a musician as well so perfect guest for this show i'm pretty sure i say that in the next show you see i have this amazing ability i can spoil shows before the show itself it's a skill i've been honing for about as long as this podcast has been going anyway that's going to be something of a momentous conversation for the reason that it's actually going to be the end of my backlog. So I'm going to be up to date. Hopefully your listeners are going to help me create a new backlog by sending me questions. Of course, I have my two other podcasts as well, Life and Life Only and Film Gold. And I think that's about it. There's links to Aaron's work in the show notes, as well as that Philip Norman episode I mentioned earlier. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you're all doing okay. Take care and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.
American writers do so much is to just overburden the writing with facts, just to show how many facts you know. And that is not what I think good writing should be. Good writing is the use of fewer facts strategically to illustrate a point.